So, um, hi everybody, um, I'm Emma, which you already know. I'm really excited to tell you a bit about what I will be doing here and also what I have already done. I arrived about seven weeks ago and have been splitting that time between getting settled in Valdivia and also doing some field work, which has been really fun. Um, yeah, so this is um, uh, my plan for my allotted time. So a little bit more, um, I guess we already did a brief round of introductions, but I went to Brown and I double majored in geology and Hispanic studies. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here and just like high on life hearing about all of the really cool environment and climate related projects. Um, it's awesome to be in this room with all of these minds. Um, so since the time I graduated in 2016, I've been mostly um, I was in the fellowship program Green Corps, through which I got to organize campaigns with different nonprofits around issues like voting rights around the election time, um, also pipeline issues and public land campaign. So, um, but I really missed doing science while I was doing that, so I'm excited to like toggle back to the science side of things now. Not sure where I'll land, but yeah. Um, so I will be based out of Valdivia at Universidad Austral. I'll be working with Mauro González, who is in the Instituto de Conservación, Biodiversidad y Territorio. Um, and that's a picture of Valdivia that I took from the main bridge. It's really beautiful there, and you should all come visit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so a really brief background on Valdivia. Um, it's thought to have been populated by indigenous groups as early as 12,000 BC. Uh, conquistadors arrived in 1544, and by the time that Valdivia was founded in 1552, it was the southernmost Spanish settlement in the Americas. Um, so it is also known for um, being home to uh, a lot of beer production, so that's cool. Uh, it was also the site of the most powerful earthquake ever recorded. And it's at the junction of three rivers and sits about 15 kilometers inland from the coast. Cool, so um, I'm gonna run through briefly some of the cool stuff that I've been doing. Um, the first field expedition I got to go on, which I left for like 20 hours after arriving in country, was at Volcán Cordón Cahuye. So I had the good fortune to participate in this collaboration of volcanic ecologists from Universidad Austral and also the US Forest Service. So there are some folks up there who work on Mount St. Helens and there's been this ongoing collaboration to study what the ecological landscape is like in areas that have experienced eruptions. So um, ecology fieldwork is totally new to me because I have a geology background. I never took any class that was related to plants or anything like that. So this is a really great learning opportunity and everybody from my advisor Mauro and some of the Chilean field hands to um, the Mount St. Helens folks were really patient um, and I learned a ton. So we did everything from evaluating the health of tree canopy cover, um, there were plots and transects set up where we would study mini plots, like one meter by one meter, along a transect, look at the vegetation cover, take a survey of the different species. Um, we would revisit uh, tagged seedlings that they had tagged in the past year, so I thought this is adorable. It's this little seedling that's <laughs> growing up through the tag. Um, and yeah, it was really interesting. Another, uh, so there are four study sites there. Uh, all names like Deep Tefer 1, Deep Tefer 2, and that has to do with the fact that there is a lot of volcanic sediment in those areas, so in some places up to 30 centimeters from the most recent eruption, which I believe was in 2011. And um, another interesting thing, we were in Puyue National Park, and we had to cross through like Chilean customs. We we're almost at the border with Argentina, but the customs is not quite at the border, so we we're in the no man's land. So we had to go through customs and come back every day, um, which was funny because they were kept telling me every day that I had to register my visa, and I was like, I know, I just got here. <laughs> and also then we would pack lunches, but we couldn't bring any fruit back in, so we'd be like eating all of our fruit at once before coming back <laughs> through customs at the end of the day, and we did that like every day, so it was funny. Uh, and this is just a map to show Valdivia is here, and then Puyehue National Park is here, so we were working right around there. So, oh, also at the end of that week, we got to hike Volcan Casablanca, which is the most spectacular 360 degree view I have ever had at the top of any hike. Um, you can see here Volcan Punte Agudo, Volcan Osorno, and Volcan Tronador. There are snow fields at the top, um, there are lava flows, 
and uh, yeah, I would encourage everyone to visit it if you can. <laughs> so the second fieldwork expedition I went on was to Volcán Calbuco, which just erupted in 2015. So um, that's pretty close to Puerto Varas on the shores of Lago Yanquiwe. And uh, what we're doing there is some similar work to the volcanic ecology in Puyehue National Park, so working with plots. Uh, another example of some of the methodologies is they have tephra removal pits where they've excavated some of the volcanic sediment and they're comparing plant growth in those pits with less tephra to what's going on with all the tephra. Um, we're also sieving some of the volcanic sediments to be able to collect the fine material, so to see what type of soil and organics have developed. Um, and there's just some beautiful vegetation out there. So this is the Fuchsia magallanica, um, the flower that you find. Uh, has anyone seen nalcas before? They're like, they're really, in the south they get huge, so this is one leaf that oh, I'm sitting in right there. Bizarre. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, that was a couple days, and then the part of that fieldwork expedition that was the most interesting to me is we're working in this river valley, the Rio Tepu, and that's one of the main rivers that drains the watershed of the volcano, if you will. But during the eruption, it got blasted by pyroclastic flows, so like hot flows of ash and sediment and dust and even like volcanic bombs. Um, and so it completely decimated everything that was in the river. And if you go there, you can see that the trees are like knocked over. Oops. <laughs> the trees are like knocked over by the force of things. And how do I? Um, so the trees are like knocked over, some of them are bent, they're turned to charcoal, um, and it's just really powerful to see. And then you have these deposits up here are like three or four meters thick um, volcanic sediment, so tephra. Um, oh, were you raising your hand? That was exactly my question. What is the, the detail about tephra? Oh yeah, so tephra is a general term for um, like the sediment that comes out of a volcano that's not ash. So if you think like really small pieces of pumice almost, um, then that's like an example of what tephra could be. So anything from like pebble size to a little bit larger, a little bit smaller would be just tephra. Um, and this is one of the coolest things that we saw there. So people think that um, all these trees that were living got buried and so that's then buried organic carbon. And so it kind of creates this biological ooze. So there are these spots where there's this algae like this dark orange algae that's in the stream but kind of ballooning up in these mushroom clouds and there's this like iridescent kind of oil slick film on top um, so all this like interesting kind of mucky stuff going on um, and that's a picture of uh, two of the folks from Oregon State this is all the the park that we're in it used to be all grass and now it's like all tephra it looks like a parking lot but that's actually volcanic sediment and that's a sore now in the background um, so anyway that was just like a really, really cool week. Uh, I was excited to work on it. Um, so Valdivia, that was the first field work, and then we're all the way down here in the lakes region. So um, the serendipitously, I got to go along with um, one of my advisor's doctoral students who studies the insect communities in areas that have been affected by big forest fires. So um, I went with him and his partner and another of their friends. Uh, so he's studying specifically the insect communities around Araucaria trees. He sets up these traps that use like a, what you use for kind of a window box of flowers, a pane of like plexiglass and a roof to keep the rain out and literally the insects fly into it and then fall into the trap which has like a mixture of water, salt and glycerin and then you go back and collect this like juicy mixture of bugs. Um, so that was really interesting but it was really cool to see. So these Araucarias get huge like 30 or 40 meters tall and um, they're burned but still standing you can see the regrowth here and this is my hiking boot for scale there's a teeny tiny aracaria regrowing in the ground there um, in the spire affected area so it's just beautiful to see the regeneration um, we also encountered some fauna so um, this is like in the wild when we were hiking my friend ended up with a um, arania poito so a tarantula on his backpack and um, it was less scary than i expected like being in the context of the forest and stuff but it was still like a moment. <laughs> so, uh, just to orient you guys on the map more, so Valdivia, um, this is the first field work, the other one is down south, and this was up here in Parque, Parque Nacional Toluaca and Reserva Nacional China Muerta, so up in this area pretty close to Temuco. So um, then actually last week I went back to the park near Calbuco to do some more work in this river valley. The collaborators from Oregon State, who are now back there, unfortunately, have more stuff they'd like to understand about 
what plant species are we growing, what the cover looks like of plant species in some of the areas. Um, and what they're trying to understand is what volcanic surfaces got deposited in this river valley when the hot flows came through, how the river has since reworked that, um, and then what might happen next. So are the surfaces going to change? Are plants going to grow there? So you can see here where the river bends, there's actually, they call it the oasis. It's like a biological hotspot because landslides from the side of the valley have brought in seeds and other organic material. And then there's actually a small waterfall. So there's input of water, seeds, you have life growing. Um, and this is just a cool geologic phenomenon called pedestaling. So you can see there are these like bigger pieces of rocks basically. And then the smaller, finer grained like sand or silt underneath ends up getting cemented, but also like holding up the larger greens. So it's evidence of erosion. Um, and it almost creates this cathedral like structure. And that's a just a clipboard for scale. Um, and so this is the like their operations are based out of this uh, geodesic dome. Like you can buy these kits online kind of and people can like make a mm -hmm. dome and it's really cool. You see them around sometimes. Um, but anyway, so this is a this is a park that was originally bought into by various business partners. They were going to develop it as vacation homes. If you go down around Yankee Way, you see there are a ton of cabanas and like that type of thing that people go vacationing. Then they decided that the land wasn't suited for that, and some of the socios bought out some of the other people, involved other stakeholders, and then they turned it into a conservation park, which is really cool. And then um, like a couple years later, the eruption happened of Cabo Buco in 2015. So suddenly it's like this um, hotbed, haha, of uh, like it's an area where you have to do science because there are these processes that happen. Now we have to understand what's going to happen next. Um, so anyway, that's another view of Osorno. And um, one of the other things that I'm helping to work on there is they're doing some drone surveying of the area, especially of this river valley, to understand what the geomorphology, so the the shapes of the landforms are like, and how that's going to keep changing. So the um, kind of one of the managing partners has a drone. We did some initial surveying, um, or he did some right after I left, and then we're talking to a postdoc who works at the U.S. Forest Service now in Oregon who did like a whole doctorate on drone surveying of forests uh, to understand how we can hopefully create a digital elevation model to be able to track some of those surfaces. So um, I'm going to be kind of the go-between, going to be hopefully working with a lab group at uh, Universidad Austral that does some digital photogrammetry, which is basically a special software where you take a whole bunch of pictures that have overlapping edges, and then there's a software that can like automatically format that into a mosaic, um, so you can see what the surface of the Earth looks like, and it's really cool. So these are some preliminary results. Like I feel like in one afternoon, this postdoc was like, oh yeah, I'll throw your pictures in there, and um, it just spits out this like really beautiful photo mosaic of the river valley, and then uh, a couple steps beyond that, you can create a digital elevation model. But we're going to go back in, run a few different flight lines, get better coverage, get better resolution. Um, so the first attempt was kind of just guessing. So um, this is all fairly different from what I came here to do. Um, so a little bit about what got me here in the first place and what my original project was going to be. So um, I had the project I had proposed was to study the impacts of the recent mega drought on the um, Araucaria aracana tree, which is a native tree species here, and it's also the national tree of Chile. So um, I, in particular, wanted to use uh, dendrochronology. So thank you so much for giving an awesome primer <laughs> on that, Talia. Um, I wanted to look at whether observed mortality of Araucarias could be accounted for by lack of water availability, and especially whether during these drought years um, that impact was disproportionately felt in um, Araucaria areas with rocky or arid soil. Um, so that project really attracted me because in undergrad, uh, when I was studying geology, I did a thesis on paleoclimate but with sediment cores, um, so we should definitely talk about that. Um, yeah, so the idea of uh, using a proxy to detect past environmental change with sediment cores, it's like my project was looking at microfossils that were trapped in the layers of sediment. Um, but this is the same concept of reconstructing past climate, just with a different proxy looking at tree rings. Um, and so the notion of working to understand climate impacts on natural resources is really exciting to me. Um, and I also got really excited about CR2, the Center for Climate and Resiliency Research. My mentor, Maro Gonzalez, is a collaborator in that as well. Um, 
And uh, so that's a collaboration between Universidad Austral, Universidad de Concepción, and Universidad de Chile, and it's funded through um, Con Conicit? How? Sí, yeah, Conicit. 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 Um, which is, uh, yeah, is under the Ministry of Education. So one of the chief goals of CR2, which I know um, Kate already talked about, is to better understand the forces of the Earth system so that Chile can be prepared to be resilient in the face of a variable and changing climate. Um, and so in a, a 2016 report about this drought that was from 2010 to 2015, that's considered to be the mega drought, um, CR2 used tree ring data to show a moisture reconstruction, um, to talk about kind of the severity of the drought in comparison with past droughts. And um, I was really struck by that. I think it's so cool to see that the government has kind of assembled this task force um, of scientists who are ready to prepare the country to be climate resilient. And also this is like paleoclimate science that is seeing the light of day. It's not only being used to inform policy recommendations, but also eventually to inform outreach and education activities to the public. So that's really exciting to me. Um, so yeah, and then you can see that this is from a CR2 report. and. They're reporting on things like uh, the fire anomalies during the drought, so other ecological disturbances. So there's a lot of good work going on there, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Um, so another quick note about the Araucaria tree. Um, as I said, it is really, really important here as an entity in Chile. Um, it's also important because it has significance culturally to a Mapuche tribe, the Pehuenche, um, who live in the south of Chile, and the Araucaria figures prominently into their mythology, um, also their livelihood and their diet. So they collect and eat the piñones of the tree. Um, and just as a side note, being here in Chile the past few weeks, I've seen like four people who have Aracaria tattoos. Um, and like if you look on maps, a lot of times national parks are marked with like an Aracaria symbol. So it's kind of one of the symbols of CONAF. Um, so it's really cool. Um, however, I will let you all read this meme that I put in there, uh, which I just wanted to use to illustrate the fact that um, nothing quite goes as planned. Uh, so I'm kind of already at the point where I've been here thinking about my project, have had time to deconstruct it a little bit, find out more about what's feasible, and have more questions than answers really at this point. So um, in talking with my advisor when I got here, we were having these conversations in 2016, like early 2016, because you all know what the proposal timeline was like and the whole application <laughs> thing. Um, so CR2 and my advisor and the people who work on this um, previously were really going in hard on the idea that there were these big patches of mortality of the Araucaria and that it was climate induced. Um, however, it turns out to just not be to the extent that they thought, um, in part because the Araucaria is a species that lives for hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's a resilient species to changes in climate. Um, and then also if you have smaller patches of mortality, but not really on any large scale. It's hard to isolate drought as a factor when there are other things like insect infestations or fungi, and you don't want to go cherry picking spots that you think are going to be um, be supportive of the idea that this is drought and drought only, because that's not good science. Um, so another thing is that Araucaria is a tree that prefers full sunlight, and it prefers moist but well-drained soil. So what that means is that it grows on these really high ridges, so like on the tops of the cerros. Mm -hmm. It's really cool sometimes if you see a cerro, you can see the individual Araucarias in silhouette right at the top because they're really big. Um, but that means that it's also hard to get to. And with a lot of these national parks, as soon as the fall and winter months come, the they become inaccessible. Like People don't visit them anymore because the paths are all snowed in. So um, one other factor here is that I would be reliant on other department members doing field work in order to get to these sites, like in terms of vehicles and also in terms of not being independent enough to be a free agent um, with the amount of experience I have doing forestry field work in South America, which is negligible to this point. Um, so I, you, I do have to look for kind of synergistic opportunities to do field work where they exist. Um, and then also just the whole nine month thing or seven months for me at this point. Um, for instance, I would really love to do a project and I propose this to my advisor on like the the interaction effects of mortality in areas that have been affected by fire and areas that have been affected by drought and then like both to see what's going on there. And then when I said that to him, he like 
jokingly, half jokingly was like, oh, like we're gonna have to get you to stay for a PhD. Um, so I think that like a lot of things are just out of the scope. <clears throat> but um, there are some things that I do know about what I want to pursue. So um, I know that my project is going to involve disturbance ecology. So that's kind of the bucket that all of these processes like fire, volcanic eruptions, and drought fall into. There are forests that exist here, and those are disturbances that affect them. Um, Additionally, I, um, I am not married to any one particular method. I would love to do some dendro work because it's super interesting to me um, in like the paleoclimate part of my brain, but I think it's really cool to hear about everybody's um, intersectional projects that are looking at um, all these different methods to inform one question. And uh, yeah, I'm not set on being like a dendrochronologist for life, and this is a really cool opportunity to explore different areas of learning. Um, that said, I would like to do something that is useful, so I've been kind of asking, hopefully not badgering my advisor, saying like, what are the things that you would like to see done or areas that investigations that have been done could be continued that you just don't have the hands to do or don't have the time to do. Um, or like if there's an issue that CONAF is particularly interested in, I would love to help out. I am here and I am disponible, so I am just like, use me, you know, I wanna, everything will be a learning experience. Um, and then, yeah, a little bit more about intersections. So um, I'm especially excited about um, the intersection between people and natural resources, which is a running theme of our group here, and I think that's so cool. Um, my original project was going to have more of that component of being directly impactful, given that the Araucaria is so important to the Pawenche people. Um, so I still would really like to involve as much as I can a component of um, interacting with knowledge from the community or understanding how science impacts the community and not working in a bubble. Um, so I'm going to be kind of on the lookout for ways to do that. Um, yeah, and then also just I keep having to remind myself of the scope being nine months. So, uh, so some of the other stuff we're going to work on, as I mentioned, I'm going to hopefully go back and visit or help remotely to coordinate and then process data from these drone flights. So before they basically imaged just one portion and now we're looking at doing several different flights um, and you have to get the proper amount of coverage for each flight. Um, and so you have to create control points to be able to constrain the geography, so knowing that a point is exactly where it is and you can mark it in the picture like year after year if we're going to be doing change detection, like flying this again in 2019 to see what's going on. Um, so there are materials that need to be associated with like creating those points and the GPS and you have to like paint something that can be visible. Um, so all of that is really cool. Um, and I'm especially excited about this because uh, I am heavily interested in mapping and in particular remote sensing as a possible area for graduate study. So um, whatever I do, I kind of want to make sure it has a mapping component or a GIS component. Uh, I want to learn some new skills in that area. Um, and so the, the park, as I said, which is now a conservation park, um, is kind of still new and the eruption kind of just happened. I mean, three years ago is it's, it's pretty recent for them. Like they remember it like it just happened. And they're still trying to figure out what their goals are, so how to involve the community. Um, I'm hopefully going to be able to help out with creating interpretive material. They want to build a trail, not like build, but like mark a trail so that people can come visit this river valley um, and create like interpretive info for people to be able to visit. And uh, so that communications aspect sounds really fun to me. They also like recently had their first art exhibit, which was just kind of little illustrations from friends that they compiled in one room of the kind of controls building. Cool. Um, so this is a beautiful watercolor uh, interpretation of an eruption that's there. So any way that I can aid that process, I'm excited about. Um, and let's see what else. So um, also it seems that I could do some dendro work. There have been studies of um, trees at Cordon Carille, so the first place I did field work looking at taking tree cores and then identifying the impact that the volcanic eruptions had on the growth of the tree rings. Um, so similar work has not been done a lot yet at Calabuco, so that would be synergistic there, take some tree cores. Um, and then uh, that also is cool because there's a geologist who's been excavating the layers of tephra at Calabuco to kind of try to date those and match them with the eruptions. And then we could also look for historical documentation about when eruptions happened. So like we know that there was an eruption in, I think like 1961 and 1929, but does it go farther back? And how can we find out if it goes farther back? Um, so 
Uh, one other thing that my advisor mentioned is there's been a study, they have 10 years of monthly data from this forest owned by Universidad Austral con, um, called San Pablo Tregua, and it's uh, in the pre-Cordillera, it's mostly old growth forest, which is really cool. It has like 10 plus species. So this dark orange part, which is like almost all of the reserve, is all of the adult or old growth forest. So they're, I think they have just traps there where they're seeing what seeds are dropping, and that's really important from um, an kind of ecological perspective because uh, understanding what seeds are being produced is an important tool to being able to understand kind of the, um, the dynamics of the forest and, um, and to see what's going on there. Uh, so they have kind of all that data processed. Oh, sorry. They have all that data processed and they need someone to keep pushing it. Another thing that they don't have enough hands to do and that they want graphs made and get the chance to do some writing and stuff. So um, last thing is I'll be taking a course that my advisor Mauro is teaching called The Structure and Dynamics of Native Forests, which is a course for master's students. So um, some of the associated work there will be reading papers about just forest dynamics, which will be great background for me. Um, then they also do have like field work trips where each student learns to use the methodologies, develop their own project. And um, it seems that for the final phase of the class, which is the self-defined project, I could maybe make something work that I mentioned before and use that as a, a way to supplement my own learning with some more like academically lit review oriented work. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, I put this picture of a Chilean salad here because um, I've decided that a good, um, a good metaphor is that my time here will be like a, a salad of mini projects maybe, or just a salad of whatever I can throw together. Uh, but I'm really excited about all of it. So I'm trying to keep an open mind to how things will keep changing um, while keeping in mind what is constraining me and looking for opportunities to either work with people, tag along on their field work trips, which has been really fun already, um, collaborate. So getting to start out my time here with like an international collaboration between scientists was really cool and really humbling. Um, yeah, and I just want to say thank you so much to the Fulbright Commission for allowing us to be here. Um, it's, it's really awesome to have the chance to do this. Um, so yeah, if anyone has questions, I am happy to take them. Thanks. Thank you guys, we'll have to save the questions for lunch. <laughs> so sorry, we used up our time.